Okay, good morning. Good morning. Yes. I mean, okay, it's fine now. But I tend to move around a lot, and I wasn't really excited about using a handheld mic. But um, anyway, we, we may switch to a hand, uh, whatever. Good morning. <laughs> and welcome. Um, we are going to get a, started a couple minutes early. Normally, we start at 1010, but you're all here, which is amazing because it's Labor Day weekend. And I fully expected to be here by myself. So thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the first things that I think we can say about pastoral care is it begins with showing up. Um, so you all have shown up today, and I'm grateful for that. Um, let us open in prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, you are always with us. And you are always seeking to give us life and peace and comfort at the same time that you seek to grow us. We thank you for this place and this community where we may experience your providence and your loving care. We ask that you help us care for those here and in our neighborhoods and in the world who are suffering. And help us, those of us who are suffering, to receive your grace. Guide our conversation. Guide our care. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So what I have kind of planned on doing today is um, continuing some of the conversation that Julia Michener started last week about outreach. And um, it's fine. And um, looking at how some of that applies to pastoral care. So with a disclaimer similar to what she said last week, uh, this isn't just a nuts and bolts of what pastoral care looks like at the cathedral. It's also going to be looking at how we think about pastoral care in general and what it is. And um, so I'm going to start with that and then look at some of the nuts and bolts and programs and then hopefully leave time for your questions. And I'm glad Julia has walked in the room because I was going to start with a review of what she said, which is going to be way off base. Um, but she... No. <laughs> no. Um, and I really do recommend, because this is kind of a continuation, and I think what a lot of us are doing in the church right now is looking at what does it mean to be church in this time and place um, at a time relating to outreach, but also pastoral care, where there are um, shifts in the way we care for one another, um, shifts in what we expect from our clergy, from one another, and from the church. And the big shift is the fact that the church is not um, the center of the city in the way it might have been at one time. Um, so we are kind of coming to terms with, we're in a new time and place, and the church is not um, the default institution that everyone goes to for help or that people just feel like they have to go to, period. Um, so we've kind of gotten away from the sense of obligation around church, um, a, a, a social sense of obligation around church. And Julia named, um, given the cultural shifts regarding the church's status and some popular conceptions of church, or perhaps misconceptions, I hope, um, namely that it's hypocritical, judgmental, arrogant, and the like, she asked the question, does the church still have a mission? And her answer was, if you heard her sermon today, I will provide some um, commentary, heck yes. So um, her, her sermon today, she said, heck no. But I think her answer to this was, heck yes, the church does still have a mission. Um, indeed, the shifts that are happening um, in the culture and in the church are, though somewhat anxiety provoking, all so good. Um, this is also a time of reformation. It's a kind of rummage sale where we are sorting through some of the things that have accumulated, some of the clutter, and discerning, well, what's true to who we are, what's essential, and what is it time to let go of? And um, what is true and essential is our Christian mission. That is our particular way of being in the world and in relation to others because of Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. And she offered a definition of that clarified mission, drawing on the work of John Pakaka something, Paklovich, P 
Pavlo, something like that, thank you, um, saying that one way to understand our mission is loving beyond our capability. Loving beyond our capability, which applies to pastoral care as much as it applies to outreach. So I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, and she also made some observations about this mission or living into this mission as it relates to outreach in particular. And this is where I know I'm going to get it wrong because it's going through my memory. Um, but that it is the ministry of all believers. Um, that's one of the things that we want to salvage from through this rummage sale. Um, but there is risk. Um, there is risk and there is cost in reaching out um, to anyone, whether that person is on the other side of the city or at the same table as you. Um, and that we give out of our own brokenness. Again, that also applies to pastoral care. And that our mission has more to do with how we are and who we are than what we do. Um, the specifics of what we do flow out of who we are, which is really important for us to hear, um, us Americans, those of us who tend to you know, be can-do people, we can do anything and everything, and sometimes are not aware of our limits or have trouble accepting our limits, um, sometimes have trouble trusting in God um, rather than in our own kind of manpower and determination, and it's kind of wearing us out. So um, all of this, I'm, I'm taking the time to review some of what I retained from last week because every bit of it relates to pastoral care also. And so the first um, thing that I want to dismantle is this distinction between outreach and pastoral care to begin with. Um, this idea that there are different areas of ministry that you have to choose between or that are in competition. Um, those of us on staff are very well aware, and I believe you all are too, of how interconnected everything we do as church is. So we gather for worship. Just take worship, for example. When we worship, we are welcoming people into this space. We are creating a sanctuary for people who may be in crisis. Um, the fact is, many people, when they are in crisis, church is the first place they come. So you, we don't even know who we're welcoming on Sunday, but just by being this place and having ushers and all these people who kind of welcome folks into the congregation, that's pastoral care in and of itself. And then we tell stories. We tell these sacred stories that help every one of us um, see, see an arc of salvation. So, I mean, our, our Christian sacred story begins with the life of Jesus, with God's presence here and the messiness of life with us, takes us through his ministry, his suffering and death to resurrection. And so simply by worshiping and remembering that story, we are offering hope and hopefully offering some healing or hope of healing for those who come here. At the end of the service, we are told, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Um, and there are many ways we do that. Some of it is out off the hill, um, away from the cathedral campus, and some of it is here. So just that's just an example of how interconnected everything we do is. Um, and so I want to continue that. So something about outreach that Julia brought up and that applies also to pastoral care and really challenges this separating of outreach and pastoral care is the idea of us and them. This category that there are the people in the church who have the answers, have the goods to give, um, don't need help, have the help to give, and they're the other people far away who have the problems. Um, we all know that's not true, right? Everyone in this room knows that there is suffering in this church. Um, there is suffering in our families. There is suffering in ourselves. And that separation of us and them, of outreach, which is what we do for those people with certain kinds of problems, separating that from what we do for people in the church is a way of kind of denying the suffering that is here and the need that is here. And that can be a comfortable thing. It can be comfortable. So 
this, I remember when I was in seminary, um, a pastoral care class and talking about how they're kind of circles of care. Um, and the broader circle is, you know, people on the other side of the world, perhaps, um, who we know only as an issue. Um, and then they're kind of concentric circles. And sometimes the hardest people, the hardest issues to respond to are the ones that are closest to us. Now, why is that? Because it could be me. It's, it's very different to think, well, you know, I can go out and help these people with these problems that are so far away from, that could be me who has a parent with dementia. That could be me with dementia. Um, that could be me who has cancer. That could be me who's grieving a lost one. That could be me who has a family member in prison. That could be me who is a victim of crime. That could be me or a loved one who is suffering from abuse. It can be hard to come to terms with how close it can be to us. And so that's one of the reasons I think sometimes that, you know, it's easier, and I'm, I'm not comparing, it sounds like I'm comparing. I'm just saying that sometimes we can distract ourselves from what's right in front of us, from the people who are right in front of us, from the messiness of our own families, our friendships, um, by, you know, getting on our white horse and riding off to help someone far away. Those are not in distinction, because the fact is the more that you involve, the more you get involved in outreach, um, perhaps through the homeless requiem or going to the prison, the more you see that also could be me. Um, and the people I meet there are also close to me and neighbors. So it's not one or the other. I'm just reacting to um, something you hear sometimes about, you know, get out of the church, get out, get out in the world. And the fact is we also have to care here. In fact, it is our life together here and the way we care for one another here um, and, and the way we are cared for here that nourishes us and empowers us and equips us and inspires us to go out into the world and care. And also that's our witness. That is also our witness. Um, so just kind of challenging this distinction between insider and outsider and us and them. And along with that, something that Julia challenged was the distinction between the helper and the helpy or the giver and the receiver. And again, every single one of us has needs, needs to receive, and every single one of us has gifts to share. So that, just, that is not a distinction at all, the giver and receiver. We may find ourselves at certain times being more capable of giving um, or being called to give, or in certain relationships being capable of giving or called to give. And we may find ourselves at times needing to reach out and ask for help. And I think that naming certain times is really important because discernment is a big part of this. Um, we cannot be all things to all people. I know we all want to, um, but it's not possible. And we don't have to be because we are members of this body of Christ. You know, I just remember those beautiful passages from Paul about the body of Christ. Um, and how there's an eye and an ear and a nose and a foot, and you don't have to be all things to all people. Um, it's much more about discerning who am I, what are my gifts, um, what are the pains I see. Something Julia talked about last week was ministering out of our brokenness or out of the cracks, you know, and kind of where are the cracks that I see. Um, all of us are drawn to respond to and have a lens of seeing certain things. I am very blind to some kinds of suffering, um, which is why I am grateful to be part of this body of Christ where there are others who help me see. Um, but we all see something and we all have gifts to respond. And so discernment is an important part of that. I say that because there are some times, um, this came up, so we have a Community of Hope group, I can say more about this, but this came up in Community of Hope discussions um, that there are some people that I may not be equipped to respond to. Um, for example, if I had a history of some kind of abuse, I may, I may be the person to help someone who's an abuser, but I may not be. 
Um, and so it's just remembering that sometimes the particular relationships we have um, mean that we have to recognize our limits in those also and trust someone else to care. Um, you know, I, I cannot be my husband's therapist. I cannot be his priest. Like, let me just tell you, that's not a good idea. <laughs> And so, but, but that's an example. There's some kinds of care I can offer um, because of the relationship and who I am, and there's some kinds I can't. And all of us have to discern that at different times. Um, so challenging this distinction between us and them, insider and outsider, giver and receiver. Um, and then I also kind of named this already. I would challenge the idea that there are different kinds of need. Um, that there are certain needs or problems that only happen out there um, and certain ones that are here. So when we think of pastoral care, we often think of um, responding in times of death or in grief or in sickness. And that is one of the gifts of the church, my goodness. Um, one of our responsibilities is to walk with one another through life as far as we can. And we mark that walking with baptism and confirmation and marriage and funerals. And so that's a huge, huge part of who we are. But there are, there's also mental illness in the church. There's mental illness in, in our small groups. Um, there's depression. There is struggling with sexuality. There, there's poverty. Um, there's financial hardship and financial stress. There's unemployment. Um, there is addiction. There is incarceration. There is being perpetrators of crime or victims of crime or just being caught up in that system. All of that exists inside the church also. I remember um, a few years ago, we hosted some women from Arendelle State Prison for lunch. And I, I saw a parishioner in the bathroom who said, oh, that's so sad that, you know, these people have to deal with this you know, incarceration, that's just so sad. I'm glad we can help them. I'm glad we can help them. And that's true, but guys, it's not just out there. Um, so recognizing that all of this affects inside and outside, and that sometimes these distinctions can be ways that, you know, we kind of want to get ourselves off the hook. Um, so I just offer that as, you know, it's all a whole, um, and it's all the same work. It is all the same work, and it is all the same mission of, there are different ways to define that mission, but I really like the loving beyond your capability, um, because it's so true for pastoral care also. Um, so why, um, I named that already, N named already some of the challenges with um, the quiet care. I think that's what I'm inviting us all to, is the quiet daily care that happens here. And I really want to lift that up. Um, that if you ask, well, how do we approach pastoral care here at the cathedral? It is part and parcel of everything we do. Just as worship is part and parcel of everything we do, and outreach is part and parcel of everything we do, and evangelism, all of these are wrapped up together. And so we approach pastoral care first and foremost simply by being church, simply by being church. Now, I want to explain or say a word about what that does not mean. Um, it doesn't mean that we run around being happy all the time. So I kind of want to get at some misconceptions about church or ways that churches have done harm in these very areas, um, in ways that churches have... Um, caused more suffering to those who are already suffering. And I think we all know this is true, and this is something we have to kind of acknowledge and come to terms with. Um, so one thing is just toxic theologies. Um, toxic theologies around suicide, for example. Um, blaming the person who has died from suicide. Um, I, there's, there's some churches who won't do a burial for someone who has died by suicide. Um, that, you know, it's the idea of it's this sin against God and others. It hurts. It hurts God and others, but it hurts the person who's suffering. 
also. And so just to, just to name that that is not helpful, that here we love even in the face of suicide. And we would never blame someone who has died by suicide, ever. There's suffering there that needs to be acknowledged and not blamed. Um, likewise, around mental illness, there are churches, there are traditions, um, Christian traditions, hopefully this is changing, but you know, whose response to mental illness is just pray harder or have more faith, um, as if you know you could just kind of snap, snap your fingers and make it go away. If that were true, no one would be suffering from mental illness. No one. <laughs> um, there's also you know blaming, just the kind of blaming the sufferer, blaming somebody suffering from addiction. Um, again, just stop, just pray it away. Prayer is a big part of it. Calling on a higher power is a big part of it, but not the only part. Um, when it comes to grief, also there are ways that churches sometimes, um, with the best intentions, cause harm. And one is, you know, we all know the platitudes that we might say to someone who's grieving. Um, it was God's will. God had a plan. Um, you'll feel better soon. Um, those aren't, they aren't helpful out of context. So I'd say, I don't want to get to where everyone's scared to say anything like, oh my gosh, I can't approach someone who's grieving because I'm going to say the wrong thing. I don't want to say that. Out of relationship, someone out of love, mistakes are forgiven and understood. But sometimes we use these platitudes to protect ourselves from the other person's suffering. My saying, you know, God has a plan to George could just be my way of not sitting with George. That's my way of saying, oh, oh, this is uncomfortable. We have to, we have to kind of make it better. Um, and that can be a way of defending my idea of God rather than entering into this kind of confusing area of not knowing, of not knowing yet how God is going to show up. Um, and I think the invitation for us rather than you know, using our faith by having answers or explanations or making someone feel better is using our faith by leaning on faith ourselves when we are with someone who is suffering, when we are with someone we want to help. What do I mean by that? I mean walking with the person through darkness, through the not knowing. I mean not trying to fix not trying to make them feel better because that again is a way of saying, it's not okay that you're here. You need to be over here. It's not okay that you're on the sad side. You need to be on the happy side. Um, but we really, when we lean on faith, we can stay with the person on, this, on the sad side, on the dark side, um, trusting that God will lead both of us through it. That is faith. We bring our faith to bear caring for one another when we show up without knowing what we're going to say, when we show up knowing this is beyond my capability, I do not know how to love in this situation. I'm going to love beyond my capability, which means I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust other people. I'm going to trust the body of Christ. It's not all up to me. And I'm going to trust myself. That's how we bring faith to bear when we care for others. Not, let me tell you the answers. Let me make you feel better. It is really kind of walking in faith ourselves. Um, and that is being a companion with someone else who has no choice but to walk in faith also. So um, I got way off track. <laughs> I have a nice linear outline, and I lost my place in the outline. Um, but so... Coming back to how we do pastoral care here, and I just talked about part of it, and some people have heard me say this before, hands down, the most important pastoral care in this church comes from each and every one of you. It does not come from the clergy, okay? The most important pastoral care comes from Christians loving others. And that is what everyone in this room, again, just by your showing up today and caring about pastoral care, 
you're loving others. You're seeking to know how to care for others, which involves caring for yourself too. So whether you're showing up today because you want to know how to help someone else, or you're showing up today because there's something you need, thank you. You are helping us be a caring community. The most important pastoral care comes from you. Now, why is that? You're on the ground with folks. I mean, who is the, who's going to be the first person when your spouse or a friend gets upset? They may call a priest first, but chances are they're going to call you. You're on the ground with folks. I think about um, in the sacristy, the altar guild, somebody coming in in the morning, you, you know, you're serving for altar guild and someone comes in, they've had a rough morning, an argument with a child, um, a parent, a, a difficult morning with an aging parent. Who's there to hear it? Whoever else is in the sacristy with them? Um, if you're, I mean, so my point is all these different ways that you just come together and show up together are vehicles of pastoral care, of caring for one another. Every small group here, whether it's a guild, whether it's a Bible study, whether it's a ministry group, um, a foyers group, every small group is a vehicle of pastoral care. And that is where the most important care happens. Um, well, I won't say most important, that sounds too. That's where very important pastoral care happens. <laughs> Likewise, Sunday morning, someone, I think Julia gave this example of someone walking into church and, you know, kind of muttering to themselves. And if you sit by them, that's pastoral care. And the clergy can't run out and sit in the congregation. We don't see everything. Um, so just the simple ways that you pay attention to other people, listen, that may be one of the hardest things to do, simple ways that you listen to others, welcome others, not just into the church building, but genuinely welcome someone into one of your groups. Um, welcome someone at the table with you. That is pastoral care, and that is outreach, and that is evangelism. <laughs> it's all of the above. Um, so the fact is, sometimes those of us wearing collars, um, the collar can be off-putting. Some people perceive this as an invitation. Some people see it as a barrier. So again, those of you who aren't wearing these, um, you might be a walking invitation in a way that clergy can't be. So the most important pastoral care happens through you, through you, um, just through your daily relationships here at the church, but also out of the church, and secondarily through small groups. Um, so before I talk about programs and what the clergy actually do do, um, <laughs> it, I do want to talk a little bit about, make some recommendations for ways that you can help us become a caring cathedral. So when I say the most important pastoral care happens through you, through the congregation, it also happens just through our being church, as I said, um, and the culture of the church. We want to be the kind of place where people feel welcome, where they feel their whole selves are welcome. Even their sad selves are welcome. Even their confused selves, even their dysfunctional selves are welcome. We want to be that kind of place. And we spread that message in everything we do. We want to spread that message in everything we do. And some of the ways that we together and you on your own or in you know, the groups you're part of can evangelize, can spread the good news that God loves all people and we are signs. We want to be signs of God's love for all people. Some of the ways that you can do that are first, take care of yourself. First, take care of yourself. First, get help yourself if you are struggling. Get help yourself if you are struggling. That is really important. We cannot um, talk about faith, talk about God's love, talk about grace, um, talk about how all are welcome here in this community if we don't believe it ourselves. 
and act on it. So honestly, I think the first witness is I'm hurting and and I need some direction. I need someone to sit with me. I need someone to talk to. I need recommendations for a recovery program. That's actually the first step. And that is a way to lead. When we do that, others see it and they say, oh, there's, I'm allowed to do that too. So I think that's the first thing is know yourself, know your needs, and don't be scared to ask for help. Um, second, Practice faith, hope, and love. Practice. I already talked about that. That's where I got off track. Um, but how we bring faith to bear in our care for one another. And that is um, leaning on faith ourselves. That is caring for others in faith, um, which means that we can leave some for God to do. We can trust in the time it takes for healing, and we can resist trying to fix or judge, or all the things that make us feel like I'm in control. Because one of the hardest things about really caring for others and even caring for ourselves is a sense of helplessness. It really does bring us face to face with a sense of helplessness, um, which is why we have to lean on faith and on God and trust in the body of God. It's not all up to you. Um, Also, discernment. Um, Like I said, prayerfully discern what is yours to do and what is not. Accept your limits. Know your limits. And again, know that it's not all up to you. Know when you need to refer. So on the one hand, I'm saying we all share responsibility. um, But that doesn't mean, and by responsibility, I just mean responding to God's love. We all have the ability to respond to God's love and to respond to needs around us. That does not mean we are all responsible for every single thing that happens. So know your limits and discern what's yours to do and what's not and accept your limits and know when you need to refer. Know when you need help, when you're getting out of your league. But if possible, stay in touch with the person suffering. If possible, don't make the referral a like, Peace out, I'm done. I've handed over to the professionals. Um, And that was another distinction I wanted to take issue with, is the distinction between the professionals and lay. Again, we all have gifts to bring. Um, So at the same time, discernment sometimes leads you to care beyond your capabilities. Um, Discernment sometimes, through discernment, through prayer, sometimes God is leading us to stretch ourselves. Um, to go to the homeless shelter, to go to a um, AA meeting, to go somewhere that is like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if this will be comfortable. Sometimes that's where discernment leads us. Um, so discern what's yours to do and what's not, but also discern where God may be calling you or where God may be inviting you to learn about something new. Um, another way that we can you all can help this place be a caring cathedral, is to be real, be honest, and when appropriate, tell your story. Share your experience. This is the wisdom behind every 12-step program. Um, The best companions through something are ones who have been there before. Um, And there is hope and there is healing in knowing I'm not alone, and hearing from someone who has been there and come through on the other side or is willing to walk with you through it. When we tell our stories, when we admit, I see a therapist, I'm depressed, that again is a way of telling others, you're welcome here. (laughs) Um, And every time one of us can do that, it creates space for someone who may not be quite as courageous or feel quite as home here sharing something like that. So share your stories. It doesn't have to be like from the pulpit. Just have a conversation, you know, um, when it's appropriate. And we want to be the kind of community that deserves to hear stories. Um, So Brene, that's complicated. Brene Brown says, you know, share your story with someone who deserves to hear it. We want to be the kind of place that deserves to hear, that has earned the right to hear stories. And a lot of that begins with not judging. 
Um, something that's really important to me that you also can help with and that all of these things are means toward this is destigmatizing certain things. Destigmatizing um, addiction, mental illness, divorce, um, death by suicide. We destigmatize that when we name it, which is why we have named, we've been naming for so long this assist training, applied suicide intervention skills training. Um, why we name that we have 12 step groups, name it. Um, but you can help destigmatize just by talking about things. There's no shame about these things. They are part and parcel of being human. And all of us have touched some of these things at certain points. Another way we can work towards destigmatizing or reducing stigma is to educate ourselves. Um, and so, so many of our pastoral care programs are around educating. Um, again, naming, but also giving people ways to think about some of these things so that we can get away from the stigma. We do not want to be a place that communicates shame and stigma. We want to be a place that communicates welcome and love and healing and hope. Um, another way that you can help this be a caring cathedral and that you already are is, like we talked about, um, just being in relationship with people, encouraging and investing in relationships. Because it's the day-to-day -day caring, it's the day-to-day -day kindnesses, it's the day-to-day -day authenticity that makes you the kind of person someone will go to when they really need to. Um, it doesn't just happen overnight. You're building up, you're building up your trustworthiness and not as a means to an end, it's just who you are. Um, but just investing in relationships and recognizing that everywhere you go is an opportunity to care. Um, okay. There's also being present, um, listening. We've talked about all that. I want to shift to talking concretely about what we're doing here at the cathedral, and then I will be quiet and um, answer whatever questions you have. And um, But so how, we, how I think about pastoral care at the cathedral. First and foremost, if you didn't hear it before, hear it now. The most important pastoral caregivers are you. And so all of the clergy and staff are really invested in supporting, encouraging, equipping you as ministers. Whether that ministry is here on the campus or outside of the campus, whether it's teaching, serving food, washing feet, facilitating worship, we want to support you in your ministries. Um, and we want to support small groups, any kind of community gathering, because those are such important vehicles of pastoral care, especially to church this size. Um, it can't all depend on clergy, and I think you know that. <laughs> but um, really, we can be effective and, well, we can just be effective um, through our small groups. The pandemic was a great example of that. Um, I saw small groups, guilds, um, broad bun with the ushers. I mean, all these people really kind of reaching out to people in their groups. Um, the clergy couldn't do that. We couldn't call 6,500 people. Um, and it wouldn't be that authentic if we did, you know? But the care that comes from the relationships you have is invaluable. We do, however, have pastoral care staff. Um, some, all of the clergy are pastoral care staff. So I'm up here, my title is Canon for Liturgy and Pastoral Care. That does not mean that I'm the only one doing visits. All of the clergy do visits. We also have parishioners who do visits. We have our Eucharistic visitor program on Sundays at our last service, for example, we, at the end of the service, send out people who represent all of us to bring communion to people who cannot come to church. If you're interested in that, talk to Julia Michener. She, speaking of outreach and pastoral care overlapping, Julia oversees the Eucharistic Visitor Program. Um, we also have specific volunteer groups that are very focused on pastoral care. Eucharistic Visitors, the Funeral Guild, Oh my, talk about ministry and pastoral care. Um, the Funeral Guild offers that. The Baptism Guild and the Wedding Guild. Oh, really, my, talk about 
anxiety um, <laughs> and managing anxiety. The Wedding Guild manages anxiety and offers all kinds of pastoral care and deals with all kinds of family conflicts. Um, so <laughs> there are some very concrete ways um, that you can serve and focus on pastoral care if you want beyond you know, what you do as church. Um, let's see, I'm gonna come back to that. So our staff and our clergy and me, um, my hope and goal for our pastoral care programs, what goes down on paper and what we do is that we support you in your ministry through education, training, community, um, reflection, that we together really are and live into our identity as a caring cathedral so that anyone who comes into this place feels welcome, feels that their whole selves is welcome and that they will be loved and can get help here. Um, that we reduce stigma, that um, we understand how all components of our life together go together. Um, so yes, we have areas of ministry, but they are all one and all contribute to the same mission um, and support each other. So that's kind of a hopes and dreams. Um, specifically, you have a brochure on your table that lists some of the particular programs. And I think you'll see an emphasis on education and fellowship and equipping the natural caregivers in our congregation. Um, so for example, we have this applied suicide intervention skills training coming up. I went through that, it's two days. It is really helpful, not just for um, suicide intervention, but for any kind of mental health crisis. And it's hopeful. And I know that sounds weird, but I left that training feeling hopeful. Um, so I recommend that for, for all of you, really, if you're interested. We also have a lunch and learn series called The Caring Cathedral um, that Canon Holder helped organize. And this is on third Thursdays. It's just a time you can bring lunch and we have different speakers. I'm kicking it off and I'll be talking kind of about the church and mental illness and mental health. Um, but then almost all the other speakers are counselors or therapists. And um, thanks again to Lauren for putting that together this summer. So that's just come you know, for an hour and you've got schedules of those meetings on your tables. Um, we also have, let's see, we offer classes like we had a grief class last year and we're going to have a grief support group that's gonna start at the beginning of October. An end of life class, um, kind of preparing for a good death. Do not think that you have to be, you know, looking at death on the near horizon to come to that class. I, I went through it, I taught it, but I've gone through it before, and it is so helpful in just reorienting your life now. Um, so I highly recommend that, even if it's, you know, you think that's far away or you're not in that demographic, it's really, really helpful for um, helping loved ones prepare and also just for living your life. Um, we also have, I mentioned Community of Hope, were you going to say something, Janice? Oh, I'm, I'm almost done talking, I promise. I didn't mean to talk this much. Um, we also have Community of Hope, which is a program for lay pastoral caregivers and lay leaders in um, Benedictine spirituality, and but it's really designed to support lay pastoral caregivers and leaders in the care they're already giving, in the leadership they're already doing. Um, and that is grounded in Benedictine spirituality, but also fellowship and training. Um, it meets 12 Sunday afternoons a year. If you're interested in that, let me know. Um, this year's cohort is pretty full, but um, you know you could kind of look into it for other years. But that's a big part of equipping the natural caregivers. Um, it's kind of a spread the responsibility in the ministry intentionally throughout the church. And then we also have um, support groups I mentioned the guilds and the ministry groups, but we also have 12-step programs. Um, we do have an AA program, an Al-Anon program. And as Canon Maxwell announced during the last service, I'm very excited that we'll be starting an Emotions Anonymous 
um, 12 step meeting this week, Wednesdays at 630. If you're wondering what Emotions Anonymous is, um, it is a 12 step program for people who want to be in a healthier relationship with their emotions. Um, and that's many of us. Yeah. Yes, I'd love for you to. Um, it, it's, um, it's helped me a great deal. And I, I would say one of the problems is that, is that people don't necessarily know that they're suffering from emotional problems. Um, obviously an outward sign of emotion of, of alcoholism is drinking alcohol, but, um, it, it, it's for people who suffer from, uh, anger, who suffer from depression, uh, isolation, uh, they, they just know they have trouble in relationships. Uh, they have trouble. Uh, I can remember one woman in a group, she had trouble going to the store because she got mad at everyone driving and she got mad at the people in the store and uh, it kind of ruined her whole day. Um, and I think that's part of it. It, it. If I could sum it up, it's that people that have emotional problems are so overwhelmed by their emotions. They don't know where they've come from, but they react in some way. And the most common is anger to it. And as we all know, when you react in anger, it multiplies the problem over and over again. And the hope is that you can learn to live with that emotion. It, it's, I don't want to trivialize it, but you know, my mother always taught me to try to count to 10. Well, uh, until I was probably 60 years old, I couldn't get, never get to one or two. I was so overwhelmed. So it's the ability to sort of let that emotion be inside of you, know it's there, and just keep going and trying to act normally. But the key component is to, at that moment, to say, I'm turning this over to God. I don't know where this emotion has come from. I have no idea why the common side, you know, word is trigger, something like that. I don't know where it's coming from. I'm not in charge of this. I'm turning it up to God. I'm turning it over to my higher power. And um, that's, that's it, but it takes a lot of work. It is a fantastic program. Uh, interestingly enough, almost a, originally church-based um, in, in uh, the Upper Women West, I believe in the 50s. Uh, started uh, wonderful literature, and we're hoping to have uh, um, a great uh, turnout for that. It's wonderful, wonderful material, and hopefully some great fellowship. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and that's a great example. We want to support what you want also. And so if you're aware of um, a need in this community and you're willing to do something about it, um, we, we want to support you. And by that, I mean, we get lots of great ideas that are like, here, you run and do this. Um, that's why I say, if you're aware of a need and you want to do something, you're willing to partner with us in um, you know, developing a program or a group, please, please, please let any of the clergy know. Um, a couple last things, just kind of nuts, real nuts and bolts about pastoral care. Again, you can look at this. It's got some good information in it. Um, we do have a 24-hour pastoral care emergency line it is 365-1003. Um, you should be able to find that anywhere, but that's you can always reach a clergy on call. Um, it may take them a few minutes to get back to you, um, but know that we are here at all times, um, and you can call that number to get one of us. I also want to just commend to you the prayer list. Um, one of the things we do for each other is we pray for each other, and that is another vehicle of pastoral care. Um, we, the clergy, don't know everything that's happening. We don't know if you're in the hospital unless you tell us. Um, we don't know if your friend's in the hospital unless you tell us. So please, please, please let us know if you know of anyone who would benefit from some intentional pastoral care, from a visit or just a phone call, um, or if you yourself would. Please, please, please let us know about that. Um, and likewise, if someone should be on the prayer list, but do make sure you have their permission. Um, we can't put people on the prayer list without their knowing and their permission. That's kind of a, 
a big brain dump. Um, I would love to hear what responses you have or questions or challenges. Oh, I didn't talk about liturgy. We do, liturgy is pastoral also. That's something I really learned during the pandemic. Um, but also with our All Saints Choral Requiem Eucharist, we have a blue Christmas service. Um, liturgy really, and funerals. Oh my goodness, funerals. I mean, really are kind of a holding place for people who are suffering or who need a word of hope. Yes, John. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, to, to counter, you know, the idea that the church is judgmental and hypocritical and all those things that Julia had cited from something, this, this is our answer to that. And, and to that point, exactly, maybe this is why I kind of harp on they're the same. Brief story about my journey. So I, um, I was really, really involved at Church of the Common Ground and, um, and also at a women's prison. And so when I started looking into ordination, people kept telling me, well, you should be a deacon. You're called to be a deacon because you're wanting to work with these people out here. And I thought, but in the same way that we work with people inside, you know, it's not like um, what I wanted was to be church wherever I was, whether it was in a, you know, a church of the common ground or at the prison. Um, so the idea that we, you know, are going in to help or give or whatever, um, just recognizing that we also need to be church in different places. And so that's, that's, that's what I bring. That's not what everyone brings. Um, but just recognizing that that's another, that's probably why I push against those boundaries so much is that um, we want to be in relationship. We want to care for people wherever they are. And the idea that there are certain things that people out there deal with that we don't deal with in here, that's wrong. Um, the idea that there are things in here that we deal with that they wouldn't understand or things that we need that whatever the they is don't need, like community, like education, like dignity, like growth. Um, you know, that's not true either. So any other comments? Yeah, Barbara. Need the mic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. And it's, I mean, that's, I, I meant to say this and didn't. Um, we really mean, you know, at the end of every service, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And that the church is a place where, I, I wrote about this this week. I mean, where really you can come, I hope, and rest and be nourished and be filled to go out into the world and do what you do there. Um, and that is where, I mean, talk about Christ's body having an impact. When every person in this room goes out into the world and in your office and your family and your school, wherever, and you're, you're a caring presence, like you don't even have to say it's because of God. You know, that's your reason and that's the faith and the strength that you have. Then boom, like, I mean, that's powerful. Yeah, so it's not, thank you. I, I don't just mean caring in the church. In the church is where we learn to care and where we get filled and nourished and supported in that work wherever we are called to do it. So, yeah. Any last comments? Because I'm going to run to church then. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.